My Garmin VO2 Max estimate is 58 again. I want to here uh, kind of document the following points. First of all, the importance or rather the role of carbs in training. First of all, no, no not first of all, second of all then, I want to go into sprint training and into by daily workout, by daily workouts, which would mean a second workout of the day. I also want to shortly mention kind of the history of at least my VO2 max estimates. And even though this might mostly be anecdata, how I actually was able to increase my VO2 max from about 51, 52, 53 to now about 58. So this is the graph of kind of getting my first Garmin watch. Actually in the beginning it looked like this and then we have this here and then it now has increased to 58 again. So first of all on the importance or rather the role of carbs. In last year, and this is also evident in the data, I first of all so first of all, after beginning to train, um, my VO2 max actually dropped. So I got a Phoenix 6 S Pro and then I the first VO2 max estimate I had was I think 52 or 53. I'm not entirely sure and in this case one can also not click on this. Now then it stayed quite the same for quite some time. Actually for in this case 6 months it stayed almost the same. And this would be I think at 50 53 or something like this or at 54 and then within a very short time frame it seems my VO2 max began to increase and increase and increase so we have basically an increase of one point well one milliliter per kilogram per minute of I'm not entirely sure right now I wasn't entirely sure whether I said the unit correctly so it's milliliters per kilogram per minute now back to this graph here I then had an increase of like a couple of Basically, within a month I had an increase of one, then another increase after one and a half months or two months, and then another increase, which then was to 57. And then at 57 it stayed for now the last six months, it almost stayed the same, apart from this one increase for a couple of days until it dropped again, and then another increase. Now, first of all, carbs. Um, this increase mostly happened in this period, where I also ingested lots of carbs. And not only lots of carbs, but I kind of took another approach at my diet. This was due to uh, getting a blood draw, and this blood draw showed quite high liver markers. I then basically ventured out into trying different foods. Also, retrospectively, it might have been a good idea. It also kind of, to a certain extent, was a bad idea, because it actually increased my body fat to quite something. And I then was, in, in terms of weight, again at around 80, 82 kilograms, whereas right now I'm a little bit lower than this, a couple of kilograms below this. Now, in terms of body fat, I don't have that much data on this. I do have actually that much kind of, actually, data on this, but also body fat data is often quite um, not that useful. Now, in terms of Garmin, at least, this is kind of what the graph looks like. So I was as high as, in this case, 18% at least measured on Garmin and currently I'm at on a yearly average of 15.2% and this is also accounting basically for this phase in which it was higher. So the yearly average now which I began to take a look at is now the 15.2%. Now given that I probably will not build like 5 kilograms of muscle from one year to the next, the most important factor is the fat that goes up and down with the weight. Now there might also be some other things as well such as how much water is drawn into the muscles by creatine and also how much glycogen is stored on average in the muscles which then also would make me heavier or less heavier. So if I'm more on a protein rich or also low carb diet then what seems to be the case is that I usually am a little bit lower in weight and this then might to be might to be be explained or might to be explained by the fact that I just am lower in glycogen stores. Now recently I talked a little bit with Copilot about the, car the role of carbs. Now I had this idea and this idea does not to, does to a certain extent stem from me but also I just copy pasted this idea and I wanted to try I wanted to see whether this was something that is useful. This idea is that with fat burning I could get as high in performance as with carbs. Now this idea in I think it it almost certainly for me is true that if I have carbs, I just perform better in workouts. I half an hour ago did a 10 minute sprint workout and I just ran as fast as I could and it just felt really good actually. So 
<laughs> compared to many many other runs before in the last couple of years where I just felt terrible running and I also tried to run really fast but I just was ridiculously slow and so now if I just compare these two feelings of running and also I had a couple of longer runs recently where I hit paces that have not really been available to me in the last couple of years before at least now in the last couple of years now already begins to um, pollute the picture I would say because a couple of years back I still had higher amounts of carbs in my diet. Now it seems to be the case that if I'm so the, the conversation with Copilot went something like this. Um, I asked whether it was whether the glycogen stores would be filled during the night or during rest as high as they otherwise would be if I also had carbs. And the answer was no. The answer was probably that so the answer was that probably the, the glycogen stores in the muscles are usually lower. Mostly because the body seems to not prioritize filling up the glycogen stores, also if it potentially could with uh, this process called gluconeogenesis, which is making glycogen out of fat. Now this could also be made out of protein, but I'm not entirely sure if this process then also is called gluconeogenesis. So this was this main idea. The body, if it has... so. The, the, I already begin to think about what was missing in this picture, which I kind of think at least I know now. And the thing that is missing in this picture is I think that the body at a certain point in time only can do so many things. So if I eat high protein and, and higher in fat or medium in fat, because fat is twice as dense as protein and carbs anyway, so one does not need to, one does not need as much carbs, not carbs, but fat, then then I do get the fat, which is nice. But if I now am sprinting, the body would need to use a process which also has some energy loss for basically remaking the glycogen. Now, if I run on a longer duration, then the body is under stress because I'm actually running and simultaneously it would have to come up with new glycogen. Now, probably it's, it would make more sense to instead of trying to now do all of these things at the same time, which in terms of if one thinks about the CPU, for example, at some point the CPU is just maxed out. And if the CPU is maxed out, one has to cut down on something. It, in terms of my work experience on my notebook, it often just means that I need to close windows. And then suddenly it actually is working again. But of course, overall, I just cannot work as fast as I could if I had all of these other windows also open. But the CPU just has a limit. I began to think of this as kind of a restaurant. Now, a restaurant at some point during the day or during the week gets groceries delivered or other things delivered that it actually then sells to the customers in kind of a form. But in order to make this, the restaurants need to cook, they need to fill up the, the, the beverages and so on and so forth. And they also might have administrative processes, they also might need the cleaning and so on and so forth. So at some point of the week, gluconeogenesis, i.e. filling up the stores with the, the delivery, could potentially happen. But now if there is, a, is, if there is lots of demand, if there are customers in-house, then it would not really make sense to now uh, allocate three of, the, three of the workers in the restaurant to just um, fill, in the, fill in the shelves with whatever came in the delivery this morning. So there is kind of a trade-off, which is that there is only a certain amount of, of workers at any point in time at the restaurant. And to allocate these properly would then in this case mean maybe not filling up the glycogen stores when already running at a high demand to serve the customers. And the customer in this case is to a certain extent whatever, whatever one thinks that basically is demanding the energy. It could be kind of the other part of oneself, it could be something that is external. Now, therefore, if now one has something that is, that is glycogen, now of course, there is now the differentiation between between fat stores, or between fat and also glycogen. Now, fat uh, does just not deliver as much energy per unit of time, so not as much power, one could say. It seems to be the case, at least uh, according to what I've read. And also, based on my experience, it seems to very much be the case that if I at least seem to have lower glycogen stores, which might be to a certain extent visible, because the muscle bellies are not as full, now, to a certain effect, uh, to a certain extent, not effect, one might kind of mitigate this downside of being on a low carb and medium fat diet with additionally taking creatine, 
but then there is also a cost thing. So if this has a kind of a similar effect to creatine, uh, to a certain extent at least, and this now costs for one kilogram 139 euros, and creatine costs about 30 euros, then that's 20 times more expensive. And also creatine is not really food, but nonetheless it has this effect. But just because creatine has a certain effect does then not mean that it is, it is actually... So creatine has an effect. Nonetheless, it is not delivering glycogen to the muscles, which the muscles nonetheless would need. So the only thing is to us, it does, or what it does, is what it seems to do is to make the energy that is already in the body kind of more available by increasing creatine, creatine in the in the body.